The session this afternoon that we're going to have is about inspiring future generations to join the fintech sector. Now, we're very well aware of the increased demand that there is for skills from across the economy as businesses, regardless of their sector, seek to transform themselves uh, through digitization. I was talking to the CEO of a construction company a few weeks ago who pointed out that in their business uh, they had 42 people with PhDs. So it just shows it's not just a battle for talent with uh, technology and media and communications. We're engaged with every sector of the economy seeking to transform themselves. And I think for, for us as a sector, uh, we need to understand what is it that we need to do to recruit more people into the sector, get that flow of talent into uh, financial services and to, uh, into fintech, but also what do we do with people who are currently in the workforce? You know, financial services employs 1.1 million people across the country, uh, and that covers roles from here in the city, in Canary Wharf, to uh, processing centres in Belfast, Birmingham and Bournemouth, uh, call centres in Sunderland uh, and Middlesbrough. So we've got a huge range of people employed in the sector, all of whom, whether in the boardroom or in the call centre or the dealing room, will find their roles affected by digitisation. And so our challenge this afternoon is to solve that problem in 40 minutes. I've got a great panel uh, to, in front of me today. Uh, Sherry Kutu, a serial entrepreneur and angel investor, the founder of um, Founders for Schools and Work Finder and Scale Up Institute, uh, who's got huge experience in getting talent into the sector. Uh, Felicity Birch, the Director of Innovation and Digital at the CBI, uh, who's leading their work to create the right conditions to enable businesses uh, to come up with new ideas, invest in research, and adopt new technologies. Uh, I've got uh, Jess McNicholas, the Managing Director from State Street. She's currently responsible for delivery of 11 all corporate citizenship programs across the region, across EMEA, spanning 11 locations and 1,000 staff. Uh, Omar Ali, uh, who's a partner at EY, who leads their financial services practice and takes a particular interest in the nurturing of talent. And at the end, Stephen Dury from the Head of Innovation at Santander, uh, who's responsible for identifying, developing and uh, delivering new innovations for Santander UK. So I'm going to ask, um, we're going to do this in two sections, one on education and then on reskilling the workforce. So just I start with you. What do you think we need to do to drive talent into the sector from schools and universities? Well, I think, I think what needs to happen really is, is you start much earlier getting into the schools and um, breaking down some of those um, preconceptions that this industry is not something that's that they can thrive in, that's attractive. You know, so, so starting much earlier with young people and getting them interested in, in working in financial services or in the fintech sector, but also critically going in, there's lots of programs that go in post sort of that GCRC because they're settling down, getting ready for their A-levels. I think you need to go in much earlier into the schools before they start to make those decisions and planting those seeds you know, that this is something that they, certain subjects that they, if they specialise in will, will help to open the doors into the industry. So I think it's, it's getting into the schools much earlier than we've traditionally done in the past. And Shuri, how early is early? <laughs> early, early is early. Um, so when we first, so uh, if I put my founders for schools, yeah. on, this is something that we've been um, creating a platform so that it's super simple for fintech companies to encourage their employees to get into schools. And when we started, it was between eight and 18. Um, but there's been a bunch of research showing that early interventions are really important. And for the conversations we're having with the Welsh government, it's as early as three. Um, and when you're talking to a three-year-old, you don't use three-letter acronyms or anything like that. No. Um, but you can get across that as a practitioner, how you felt when you were young and what you're doing and how it's interesting to you um, and filling you with hope and enthusiasm. Um, we last, about two weeks ago, we, we released new research on age-appropriate encounters with schools, school children. Um, and just three encounters will triple the percentage of kids that choose a STEM subject. Now, if we think about the talent crisis and about how we could just accept that extra customer order if we could hire the person who had the right skills or if we didn't have to put them, you know, tr train them for six months in, um, that problem becomes a lot less. So, you know, we're part of the solution. Um, and there's super sexy, great tech platforms 
they take it down to about 15 seconds to make it easy for you to get into the schools. And then also from a corporate responsibility point of view, from reporting on how many interventions your employees have had yeah. um, and at what ages and on what sort of interventions. So I, I think it's critical, but we're the solution. We can't, as practitioners of this art um, in this fabulous sector, which we've been infected by and we love, um, we, have to, we have to sort of sp you know, spread that around and spread the good word. But when you talk about it, uh, three interventions, yep. is that three weeks, three months, or is it a few minutes? It's a few minutes. So three 20-minute interventions, like little TED Talks, um, will change. There has been shown, there's research that's shown that it triples the percentage of kids that will choose a STEM subject. Um, and there's all sorts of research. There's a huge amount, because this is a huge problem, there's a huge amount of research that's been done. Um, but we've... Uh, in, uh, uh, if you do four, I mean, again, three triples the percentage of STEM, four interventions drives down by 85% the chance that they will ever become neat. Um, there's a huge amount to show that just encounters with people like us makes an enormous difference. And so if you can make the market that much easier, then, uh, then the problem will disappear. And not in 20 years time or 10 years time, we have some complaints um, from some schools who, who use our for services and say, we don't really know what to know. You know, we've now had 45% of the children choose computer science, but now we have to find a computer science teacher. It's like, okay, well, that's, that's kind of your, it's, it's our problem that you can't find a computer science teacher, but if us going in and just, you know, on the way into work and talking about what we do causes children to see how that's a really interesting industry, then um, you know we just you know change change it. But it's it's easy, and simple, and you don't have to do a lot of prep. It's not. I mean, I know we all worry about productivity. So, do you think well by allowing or encouraging my employees or your members to to go into schools, is that going to you know kill our productivity in the UK further and drive it further down? It's actually going to drive it up, yeah. um, and and we and we need to do it. And again, just you know, 20 minutes on the way into work. You know, uh, the educators now have great platforms also that they can use to make it really easy for them to string together a coherent curriculum. So one day you're meeting somebody from Santander, the next day you're meeting somebody from, you know, a, you know, a, fintech, you know, a fintech company that may like do deal, the next week somebody else. And then over time they can piece together, oh, well, I remember the Santander, you know, gal, she was talking about this. And then I remember what, you know, the deal, deal, deal and they all really like their, their jobs. And they, they start to piece together and learn and put in their own mind what working in the financial services industry is like and not depending on what they may read, well, they probably don't read the papers, but what they may watch on TV or, or anything else, but hearing from us who are in the industry why we like what we, what we do. I you know, was seduced into this industry about 30 years ago. I thought, oh, do I want to go in the financial services industry? And it's the best, it's the best. It's a fantastic, you know, it's a fantastic place with great colleagues and we need to get that across. And it sounds like something we can all do. We can all do it. Um, I actually think that, I mean, I think most companies now have their two days of, you know, their two volunteering days per annum. I think that every single one of them should be spent in schools talking to the next generation and letting them know about that. And I also think that for children that are older, 16 to 18, it's really important that they get experiences of work. So have a pack of students in doing a neat project for you, um, and that also makes a difference. It depends on the age, and it yeah. could be that you know, what you're doing is compliance heavy, in which case do a project for 18 year olds and get them to, you know, do something, do something for you. But, you know, we have a, again, our system matches people. So you can have, get your third year physics students in who you really want to hire, or your, you know, math specialists who you know you want to hire, and make them supervise five students who are 17 and, you know, thinking about whether or not they want to sort of, you know, study math or, you know, some, you know something in, in university. You can match it, and again, these matching programs that don't, rely on the employer having to do all the work, yeah. I think are kind of all the rage now, and they're Correct. exactly what we should be doing. Sounds like we can have a stall outside to yeah. people leave yeah. this room. Yeah. Stephen, how does this resonate <laughs> with you? Like, well, maybe people just drop their children off on the way out. <laughs> Actually, I think um, one of the things that comes through very strongly for me is this whole point around bringing it to life, making it relevant, giving it um, some relevance to those that are getting engaged in, in financial education. It's, uh, I think the, in, in particular, the first experience many people have of banking will be the account they have or the branch that's on a high street. Um, and I think that shapes what's considered to be banking today and in future. And until you bring to life the, 
types of roles and the experience in, and the digitization of the market to children of various different ages, there, there's no chance of understanding and engaging them in what the future of finance will look like. Um, and given how savvy children are now with digital devices, tablets, mobile phones, um, it's very easy to bring that to life. When was the last time you saw a parent pay with cash? Actually, it's contactless, it's Apple Pay. Now, what does that mean? Actually, have a conversation about that. How does that change the way the industry will be perceived? How does it change the type of skills that people need? What type of experience would you expect? Now, if you start with a conversation like that, you make it very relevant instantly to the group you're engaging with, and I think that's hugely powerful. Mm -hmm. But can I just take you on from um, talking about uh, children at schools to, to universities and students? Stephen, I've heard uh, Nathan Bostock, your CEO, talk about the number of links Santander has with universities across the UK. What, what's your impression of the, of the young people coming out of universities and the type of skills they have and whether they are fit for uh, the world of, of financial services and fintech? I think it's quite, it's mixed, I think, would be my view. I think the, the passion and the enthusiasm is certainly there and the desire to get involved in the sector is there. Um, I think we see certainly where people have had experience of working on live practical examples or, or uh, projects during their degree, um, working potentially with industry, whether it's with Santander or others, actually the ability to come straight out of university and go into practice those skills uh, goes up significantly. And whether that's with a larger established player in the market, because there's these established um, relationships between universities um, and firms. Uh, we've got partnerships with 84 universities around the UK. And we fund and support various different projects um, and internships and so on and so forth. And we equally work very closely to help fund internships into SMEs, which, again, the experience is the most important piece. Um, we certainly see then the readiness of of uh, graduates to have an impact in a firm go up the, the more the experience is there. Um, I think if I looked wholesale for the future in terms of what the industry is going to need, um, I think there's going to be a much greater demand on a certain set of job types um, over the next three, five, seven, ten years, whether that's uh, software engineers, data science, digital product management, uh, UX, UI, design, experimentation techniques, customer research. Um, there's going to be a much greater demand on those types of roles. Uh, is, the, is academia in a place to supply the demand? Um, possibly not, but that's probably where there's a gap between uh, good quality measurement of the demand that the industry has and the communication back to universities. We can't expect universities and that pipeline through from school to universities for STEM subjects into professions to be solved unless we work out how we solve that together. Um, and that's something I think we all have a responsibility to do. But, but what do you, you were saying earlier, uh, before we came in, about the issue around gen gender diversity and recruitment into the sector, particular subjects? Can you share, share that experience with the Sure. Um, a few, uh, few weeks back, um, we launched a report with um, Odgers, uh, the City UK, um, a Santa Day, which is called Fueling FinTech. And it talked about a whole host of the challenges that the industry is going to face. Um, when Nathan, our CEO, was um, talking at that event, he described how the split between the genders changed when we started to focus more on STEM subjects through our graduate programmes. So our graduate um, and apprenticeship programmes have typically had a strong focus um, on uh, more general um, subjects, so actually moving people around within an organisation. And it attracted a strong 50-50 uh, split, effectively, between the genders. Um, if you look out to the future um, of the sector, and we feel like we need much more focus on software engineering, on AI, on data science, the, the moment we start to introduce some of those uh, terms into the recruitment process and we look for those skills specifically, the gender diversity changed. Um, and it changed to more of a 75-25 split rather than a 50-50. Um, and I think that's a reflection of, uh, I think, the pipeline of... Uh, uh, students and graduates that are coming through. So back to that challenge, unless we get back into the schools, yeah. engage uh, a broad uh, split of the genders uh, through pre-GCSE, GCSE selection, into A-level and then to university, I don't think we will see necessarily the change that we need in the sector immediately. Um, I hope that helps, helps to explain it. But what do we need to do to change that? Felicity. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think I think that that's um, gender diversity is, is something clearly that sits with with all um, with all companies, um, with all people, um, and it's and it's not a it's not a sort of simple um, solution. But I think 
it's absolutely vital that as a sector in particular that we do address this. So um, at CBI, I look at um, the tech sector more generally, not just, not just fintech. Um, and this is the sector that's changing the world right now. This is the sector that is um, absolutely driving and creating the future. And then if you look at fintech um, specifically, um, it has huge, huge potential to open up um, the capabilities for, for individuals to engage much better with the um, financial services um, sector and to look after their financial health better. So it's absolutely imperative that the sector is, is pulling people in from a, from a wide range of backgrounds. Um, and, and as I say, we're, we're grappling with this across the whole of tech and what we've done at the CBI is set up a, a women in technology um, network. And what's really amazing is as soon as you bring together people who have faced um, challenges with, with diversity, they've got some really clear experiences um, that you can learn from within your own business that you can, that you can address that with. So looking at things like um, diverse recruitment practices within a business. Um, so what can, you, what can you do to make your recruitment practices um, uh, name blind, for example? Can you be competency based? Actually, can you use technology a little bit more cleverly to, um, to recruit more diversity? So I've spoken to one of our members who was um, recruiting in, uh, in India, um, and they recruited entirely through, um, through computers, and people had to do um, decoding assessments through, through computers. Um, and they hired a young woman who was from... Um, who was from a poorer caste, was finding it very, very difficult to get into work, and it utterly transformed her life that they opened that opportunity up to her. So there really are actions that companies can take um, that aren't just good for the company, but genuinely have positive um, impacts throughout the whole of um, throughout the whole of society. So I think that that does, that does sit on businesses, but then it's not just thinking, ah, I've recruited diverse people, I've ticked that box. It's actually then about how do you make your business a really good place for, for people to yeah. stay and to, and to want to work. Um, and then it comes down to things like the sense of purpose and the values um, that your organisation projects. Um, but it also comes back to genuinely listening to your, to your staff, genuinely listening to your employees, and if there is a grievance, making sure that they have the opportunity to raise it and you rectify it for them. I want to park that and come back to it, uh, about workplaces in a second. But can I just talk about your members' experience of working with universities? Yeah. Yeah, because you know, to go back to um, the point that Stephen made about the sort of skills that we're looking for uh, in the future and how we communicate those to universities. Do you get the sense that the, that dialogue between business and universities is strong or is there more to do to, to strengthen it? So both of those things. Uh, I think you know, the first thing that, uh, that any business that I would uh, talk to um, in CBI membership would say about UK universities is, is how brilliant they are. Um, and actually, we're really lucky to have that as, a, as an asset for the UK. And I think we always do need to um, come back to that. But when you talk to um, businesses that are primarily in the sort of high-tech sectors that are used to uh, investing in people with, with high-level skills, the big challenge is not so much that they might not have the AI skills or the data science skills or the coding skills that you're after. Um, it's much more how you apply those in a, in a commercial environment and whether they have the, the sort of business skills that sit around that. Um, and one of, my, uh, one of my members sort of phrased it that we're going to have to make sure that our young people can turn the midlife crisis into an art form. And <laughs> I like that one. Um, and, and, I think, and I think that that's, that's a really important question as well, because we think about the commercial skills that people might need. But, but actually, you know, skills for digital are a lot broader than, um, than digital skills. And that's partly something that universities have to help people with. They have to help people try and understand what the world of work is going to look like. But it does really sit on businesses as well. And once people are in the company, um, it's something you should very much much um, commit to supporting your people with. Can I just, um, so there's been quite a lot of research so it shows that working in projects and making things together is really important. So you may be an amazing mathematician or physicist, but it's working with people, it's that communication skills and those other skills that, which are super important. Um, and over uh, you know, several bits of it. So it's not having one work experience um, session at Santander that's excellent is actually having it four or five um, so that you are learning and context switching between the different workplaces and through those different projects where one time you're asked to do a project on I don't know, market entry, the other one might be in trying to figure out price sensitivity. Um, it's those, it's the combination of those that, al that allows the cognitive processes around a learner to take place. So historically, it's like, well, it doesn't really matter how much work experience. Well, 
there's a huge amount of research to show that the work experience that impacts a person's ability to work um, is unsatisfactory at the moment in the UK. 51% of it is seen to be unsatisfactory. So we have to work really hard as employers to think about what's a meaningful sort of experience of work and, and accept that, I mean, the research shows that it's about 100, 100 hours across different organizations that will set someone up so that they're not gonna flip out from, from a permanent position. And I'm really worried about the statistics that show that of, you know, the, uh, on average, the millennial who is 30 has had 10 different jobs by the time they're 30. That is a huge productivity hit. Now, if they'd done a few low barrier tasters before they took their first job, I think that, you know, that, that they, you know, they would stay in jobs for two, three, four years rather than sub a year, which is very damaging to us. So little tasters, they can actually learn and reflect on what they need. It's a lower, barrier to us taking them on. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's part of the answer to our productivity puzzle and to the, with, you know, in Hadoop um, and some of the data science categories, 8,000% jumps in demand from employers across all sectors in the past three years in, the, in a research study that's just being put out by the Royal Society. Now, if you've got some sectors that are just exploding, um, you know, you need to make it easy to onboard people and for them to have little tasters and make up their mind. We have to be a very attractive place for people who have those skill sets as employers. So it's quite a challenge, isn't it, to you know, someone who only had one job until he was 30. Uh, <laughs> the, the idea of having 10 jobs uh, by your 30 but it's is just amazing. quite a it, radical shift, isn't it? Well, if I, you know, I, I've been with LinkedIn for about sort of 10 years. It's very interesting. The patterns are entirely different now than they were 10 years ago. And the power has shifted absolutely away from the employer and absolutely towards the person who has the talent. And we mm. all have to bear that in mind. Omar, can I just ask you, your uh, EY is sponsoring the uh, FinTech census to be published uh, shortly. What are the emerging uh, findings from there about work and employment and skills that we should be thinking about? Sure. Um, but I've always been told, Mark, when you're on right at the end of the day, there are three things that you should do. First is to wave to be seen. <laughs> the second is to speak up to be heard. And the third is to shut up to be appreciated. Yeah. So, but just before I do, before I do the last, <laughs> let, me answer, let me answer your question. It is clear all throughout the day, and I was listening to the previous panel also, everyone will talk about the talent crises, the issues that we have across the sector. But being in a place like the Guildhall gives me hope because 800, 900 years ago, this place was the hub for getting talent to be skilled. Tradespeople would arrive here, they would be trained up, they would meet with like-minded people. And of course, year in, year out, generation after generation, we've seen the reinvention of the city. So my hope is events like this, and as we have the dialogue, the work that Stephen did with Odgers, the work that Innovate Finance are doing with FinTech for Schools, the work that Sherry's doing with the Lord Mayor around work experience, will will ensure that we can deal with this. But I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge. So the World Economic Forum recently published some research which showed that the sort of emerging jobs in financial services, some of the areas that Stephen was outlining, data, data specialists, AI, machine learning, uh, UX system architects, engineers, innovation roles currently make up something like 15% of financial services roles. The World Economic Forum estimate that that will be up to 29% by 2022. That's a massive gap, and so therefore I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge. And that has been borne out by our census. So we've just finished the field work. We are um, hoping to launch it, uh, working with HM Treasury and Innovate Finance sometime later this year. But some of the themes are merely an echo of what the panelists have been speaking about. First is that fintechs, and we've got a really good cross-section of UK fintechs, are really optimistic about their prospects. Um, a large proportion of them think that they will be doubling their revenues over the next year or two. But the biggest constraint they find to their growth is accessing the right skills and talent. And then when you cut beneath that and say, where are those issues? The same old things come out. So the lack of being able to access the right folks with 
um, engineering skills, UX skills, more broadly AI and machine learning skills. It's all the stuff that we've been hearing. And when you go into the next level and say, actually, something in the order of 25% of those that work in banking and finance, the 1.1 million that you talked about more broadly, but of those that work in London come from overseas. And when you cut that again, 17% come from the EU. And we live here now, you know, nearly into May, and we still don't have a vision or a view of what our future immigration system will be in a post-Brexit world. And therefore, what's come out of the census is a big demand from the fintechs to get some clarity on that because the need is there. And of course, you add all of this together and you say, when we start talking about Santander's links to 84 universities, you say, Stephen, the vast majority of fintechs, even those that are in scale-up territory, they can't do that. So the access to the talent that we are talking about that some organizations like ours at EY or at Santander can do on a um, bilateral basis with universities or with schools isn't open to the majority of fintechs. And that's why a lot of the work that Innovate Finance and the City UK with your um, fintechs, uh, with your skills hat on, Mark, is really important because we need to be able to find a way of combining the voice of the sector as a whole to represent back what we need from academia and around. And further education and further education colleges, which I know have been you know, representing themselves to you, Mark, with your, um, with your skills hat on, we shouldn't forget them in this mix. And actually, our evidence shows, just sorry, that what we, our evidence shows that our success rate on taking school leavers versus graduates is significantly higher, yeah. as measured by two things. One, their first time exam pass rate, which is surprising. Um, and second, the lo loyalty. So we've all, you know, Sherry's talked about people not having, you know, people having, changing their careers often. We find that school leavers do that less. I don't know if it just commands a loyalty premium if you take a chance on them when they're 16 or 18 over when they've come out of university. But one of the problems, we can't rely upon a flow of uh, students and young people to solve the skills problem. No. Yeah, so so what's, what's, what do we need to do about reskilling the existing workforce? There's a great line I saw, I think it was in a... Um, a World Bank report recently said we should be protecting the people, not the jobs. So what is it that we need to do to reskill the 1.1 million people industry already? We're not going to get all the AI specialists we're going to get that we need from university. So how do we reskill? What's the best thing to do about that facility? So I think it's a really important um, question, this one, and we've been doing some research with our members to try and understand how their uh, digital skills needs are evolving more generally. Um, and the thing that it's shown is that um, perhaps com companies aren't as worried as they should be about their future digital skills needs because most of them, their dominant strategy is, to, is going to be to recruit externally. Um, and if everyone is trying to recruit externally, we're going to run out of people pretty quickly. And we're already seeing that in some of the highly skilled areas. Um, so one of the things I would uh, encourage companies to think about uh, is shopping in their own wardrobe. So this is the, this is the concept that um, you, know, you might already have a load of clothes in your wardrobe which are, which are really nice, but they're, they're a little bit dated or there's something about them that doesn't quite fit. Um, but if you take it to the tailor or if you wear it with something else, um, it's, it's gonna look great on you. You've just saved a load of, uh, you've just saved a load of money um, and um, and you sort of repurposed something and given something new life. And, and actually, um, a lot of companies have a lot of really skilled people uh, already within them. And the skills that you need for digital transformation are not only digital skills. Some of them are marketing skills. Some of them are creativity skills. Um, and even if your, your marketing team, for example, don't have all of the digital skills you need, they do already have an interest in, and very likely a loyalty to your company. And if you talk with them about the future, um, career that they could have if they upskill. You may find that the people are really, really interested in doing that, but there's, there's quite a lot of good process um, out there amongst our membership in engaging people in those. Um, so companies might have, a, have an innovation council or a digital skills council where people can actually discuss sort of what are the skills needs within the company, what might I have to do to skill myself up to meet those. Um, so enabling your people to do that and not making them feel like it's done to them um, is, is an important part of that as well. And Jess, how do you think we can do that in, in corporates? Well, I, I'm just 
the point that you made about the innovation councils and, and you know that's something that we've seen a lot of success with and, and our certainly on our some of even our employee networks have been a great source for us for looking having those conversations about upskilling you know people within those networks and actually encouraging them to look across the organization for different roles, but also having those business leaders come into them and say, look, this is where my business or my department is going. The challenge I'm having is finding people within the organization to do that. So um, it's been giving them exposure to a cohort of people that they may not necessarily have even considered before. So it's opening that dialogue across the organization. It's the same challenge that we face you know, in this space as we've seen that's happened with gender diversity you know when in most companies at entry level it's 50 50 gets to halfway and it goes like that and and the the resolution is oh well, we need to, there's no talent out there we can't find the talent but you've got 50 50 representation in your organization at the entry level so what are you doing to upskill everybody at the same rate so they can progress so it's the same principle to apply to this you should be making sure that there's constant um, programs are in place to co continually upskill and that takes investment that takes investment so I think companies have to be prepared to do that internal investment as well into how they're developing them. And actually one of the things that we found doing our um, work on the skills task force is that financial services are amongst the lowest spend on skills training per yeah. head Absolutely. across the economy yeah and so when actually we talk about we can't find the skills we're not necessarily investing yeah and that's Absolutely. part of the, that the problem in, yeah. in that. I think um, uh, lunch and learns, I think, are very commonly used. Hackathons yeah. are used. I was with LinkedIn when we made the billion pound acquisition of lynda.com, which is an ed tech company dedicated to helping employees in financial services and other firms learn in bite-sized chunks. Um, so I think the, I know that we're talking fintech, but the ed tech industry is trying to help large corporates um, also rise to that, to that challenge. You've got Coursera, you've got Udacity. Um, I do think that the universities are kind of missing a trick by allowing these new entrants to come in and um, have their executive education cake. Um, but you know, I think that they're, you know, look at Future Learn, there's some really great new innovations that help large companies and more importantly, small companies who don't have the training budgets and also don't know how to go about and you know, choose what are the effective courses. What I like about lynda.com and Coursera is you can see the ratings of the employees who have been on them before. And that's that trip advisor of, well, don't go on that course, it's terrible, is really important for all of us um, and, and it makes it easier for us. So EdTech is helping FinTech in this case, I think. And that's part of the challenge is I think that if you can equip your existing workforce with skills and you've got things like Lunch and Learns, you've got awareness courses, and I've talked to quite a few banks and other institutions have got those. Part of the thing is then, so have you created something, a knowledge that is transferable yeah. and can be validated? Mm. You're, you're nodding there, Jess. Is that something? Yeah. That you're I, absolutely. And I think it's, it's also um, not only um, with, with young, we, we see it all the time with you know, the young, young recruits coming in, millennials. They, they are not afraid to go across the organization. You know, we've all experienced that. But I think there's a, there's a missing link in terms of with your existing staff that may have been with your company for 10 years, is actually showing them that they have a skill and them knowing that they have a skill that can be transferred into that new innovation IT division that's starting up. That it's okay, they may have worked in an ops, but they have something critical that's actually relevant to that as well. So um, it's, it is, it's, it's quite frustrating because the skills are there, the talent is there in the organization. It's just opening people's eyes to it within organizations. Yeah. Omar. I mean, that, Jess's point is absolutely right. Finding a way to unglue the vast majority of the talent that sits in the organizations, which is not millennial, is clearly the key part to, I think, solving this. To my mind, there's three bits, and we talked about solving the talent conundrum. First is around getting education and the education system more fit for what the fintech sector requires. Second is getting an immigration system in place post-Brexit that allows fintechs to continue to recruit the best talent irrespective of where they come from. And the third is getting the reskilling sorted out. And on reskilling, I agree with what the panelists have said, but two, two bits that strike me. The first is, even if you get the reskilling to work right on the supply side, you need the demand side to be working as well, particularly awareness. So awareness of the roles that exist in fintech is still really low. Yeah. yeah. And principally because the sector itself 
is, is maturing, but it's still pretty nascent. It's fragmented, and it doesn't really have a single home for where people can go to say these are where this is all the types of skills I need and the types of jobs that are out there. And of course, Innovate Finance have only just launched the, um, their jobs portal, which hopefully will start to become a bit, of a bit of a melting pot for it. And then the second point is, at the big firm level, P&Ls go against reskilling. Yes. Why? Well, principally because a P&L owner, like Stephen, if he wants to um, get new people in, the easiest way for him to do it, and I, I don't mean this to, in any way, it's easy, but is to make people redundant, take a charge, and then you go in, in your other line to go and hire people because guess what? Retraining all that staff is hard work. You put the recruitment out, it's, you know, and the P&Ls start stack differently around it. So organizations need to start to see the economic upside of reskilling. And when we've done work for clients before, Mark, as you know, the economic case stacks up massively. If you can get it right, if you can get a certain proportion of your workforce reskilled, exactly as Jess says, the innate skills are there. They just need to be repointed in a different way. It's counting sort of the problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Stephen. I think to build on that, I think what we will start to see is that the importance of investing in the reskilling is the way to bridge the gap in the short term until we see the pipeline come through. So I don't think this is an option. I think it's something that has to be done. Um, I feel that there's um, an important breakdown on the reskilling. One is related to how the roles that people do today are being digitized. So working in a call center seven or eight years ago to working in a call center in five years' time will be a very different place. And how you ensure that the teams have got the capability and the people in the roles to perform in that role requires significant investment. The other is related to the type of roles that an organization will need in future. And that's where you need to invest in either reskilling to entirely different role types using similar, similar or common um, capabilities or looking to recruit recruits into an organization. Um, I think that, that Slightly different things, but both, to me, have to be addressed. Can I just pick you up on one point, Stephen? You said we should uh, reskill until the pipeline arrives. <laughs> the skills we're training people for today, we talk about AI and data. We didn't, uh, couldn't imagine those 10 years ago. I suspect in 10 years' time, we were now saying we've got too many AI specialists yeah, yeah. and we need to retrain them. I just think there's something about this, which is the constant need for all of us to reskill. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and... You know, we can't just expect either to recruit on the spot, pro, the spot market of skills through immigration or rely upon future generations to sort us out. I think collectively, actually, we need to resolve this for ourselves and think about the responsibility as employers or as employees to constantly keep up our skills and be curious about what's going to happen next. I think that picks up on Sherry's point, actually. The diversity of experience that you get from doing multiple roles can make you far more effective at working with other people in a business. Absolutely. So whether it's the three-year-old getting their 21st, 20-minute intervention <laughs> uh, on uh, fintech or someone like me on their third career, it's just an ongoing process. That draws us to the end of, the, end of this afternoon's panel. Can I thank Stephen, Omar, Jess, Felicity, and Sherry. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well done.